Hello everyone and welcome to a special feature report which we've recently released on the state of the 2022 bear market. And we've released this in collaboration with CoinMarketCap Research. So really trying to get a bit of an overview of what's going on within the current market structure. And we're going to explore it through the lens of both Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a lot of the fundamentals in terms of stable coins and what's going on under the surface. So the performance of digital assets in the first half of 2022 has been pretty rough. We've seen that Bitcoin has drawn down about 75% from the peak, Ethereum over 80%, and June was one of the worst years that we had on record in terms of price performance. But under the surface, we're seeing a lot of evolution and changes within the fundamental structure of this market. We're seeing things like the dominance of stablecoins start to shift. We're looking at how risk-off sentiment actually shows up within on-chain metrics. We saw both Bitcoin and Ethereum trading below their realized prices, and that's something to certainly be paying attention to over coming weeks. And we can also see stress developing in both the Bitcoin and the Ethereum mining industries for two different reasons. One is price, but the other one on the Ethereum side is actually the upcoming merge. Now, just as a bit of an added bonus for the launch of this particular report, we are actually putting on a limited time offer. So for Glassnode yearly subscriptions, you will be able to get one month off that subscription by using the code CMCGN at checkout. This will be valid through the month of August. And if you want to look at what you can get a bit of a, a view of what you can get out of an advanced subscription, please do check out the dashboard that's in the link below in the description. You'll find that that's really designed. This is where we're really trying to design these dashboards, these concepts, and these videos to really pick up what you can pull out of an advanced subscription. So giving you a fairly broad overview of the power of these tools, we use things both from Glassnode Studio, but also we really leverage Workbench, which is really the, the workhorse of the Glassnode suite. It allows you to create custom ideas, custom metrics, and really explore concepts that go beyond just a single metric. So please do let me know in the comments if you have any feedback or, or um, responses on that. Um, hopefully you find these dashboards that are really targeted towards that advanced audience um, and trying to give you the maximum edge as we start to transition through this cycle of this later stage bear and see how the market recovers from there. So here we are in our dashboards. This has been released today on the 29th of July. And what we're really going to do is just go step by step and talk through the different concepts and really explore the market structure from top to bottom. Now there's four sections. We're going to look at general big picture market structure. We'll look at the Ethereum bear, sorry, the Bitcoin bear market, then the Ethereum bear, and then we'll close out by looking at the mining industry. So they're the four sections that we will go through. So to start off with, um, as we come towards the end of, end of July, we haven't printed this monthly candle, but the June response, the overall market performance was actually some of the worst we've seen in history. So for Bitcoin, we actually have to go all the way back to 2011. We actually have to zoom this chart all the way out to see it. We have to go back out to 2011 when Bitcoin was under $5 to find a month where we had as bad price performance. Now for Ethereum, we saw this in 2018, November 2018 at the very bottom, and in March 2018 as the bear market kicked in, where we saw this down 35% and down 42.5% for Ethereum. So very, very significant down sells. And as you can see, we're starting to see a little bit of a recovery over the course of July. So the market's coming off a very, very angry sell-off through June. And we're now moving to that phase where perhaps we may be moving back into a bit of a recovery, or at least over the short term. Now, one of the interesting uh, um, metrics to track is people look at Bitcoin dominance. Now, this has multiple variations. In this particular instance, this is purely a dominance metric of Bitcoin at a high value, Ethereum at a low value, um, purely looking at their market caps. Now, the reason that we're only looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum is because they really are the top two assets. They've been the top two for a number of years now. They're starting to solidify. Bitcoin has never changed its position as the top asset in the space, and Ethereum has now held it for multiple years at number two. And really, Ethereum has demonstrated almost a role as the leader when it comes to the altcoin space. So we really see that Ethereum strength tends to flow down. So it's a nice indicator to really just assess at a very raw level between these two market caps, which asset is outperforming. Now, during the start of the bear market, you can see here that these large negative prints here, this is showing that Ethereum is outperforming. And we can see that this starts to deteriorate as we came into the top end of the 2018 bear. So we saw that there was Bitcoin dominance through the first part of the bull phase. As we come into the top, we see that Ethereum tends to dominate, but it starts to weaken out. And then as we transition into the deep phase of the bear, Bitcoin dominance explodes and holds at much higher levels. Now, we saw a much similar pattern during the 2020-21 bull. 
We saw a phase where Ethereum started to outperform. We saw an extended period where Ethereum's outperformance was quite strong. And then we started to see a deterioration as the 2022 bear really kicked in. We saw Bitcoin dominance start to climb. Now we've seen a little bit of a relief rally over recent weeks, and this is something to be paying attention to. Is ETH able to actually break this trend? And is the merge gonna give it that extra impulse? Or are we gonna see a reversion as we've seen previously back towards stronger Bitcoin dominance? This is certainly something I'm gonna be paying attention to, and it will probably add color to how this bear market plays on from here onwards. Now, one of the big reasons why Ethereum had such a challenging 2022 was a deleveraging that happened in the DeFi space. So we saw over $180 billion get wiped out of TVL. This is the overall value that was locked into DeFi protocols. We can see we had an explosive growth to the upside and then over 72% of it was flushed out within the span of 2022. So a very, very significant washout. We really saw a lot of the excess leverage and accumulated leverage get flushed from the system. And naturally with Bitcoin, and in this instance, Ethereum particularly, as one of the more liquid assets, the exit valve was into stable coins or into ETH, which was then able to be sold. So investors who were deleveraging their positions used these liquid assets to actually get out of their, their position. And essentially that added to the sell pressure on the way down. So a significant washout, but as we can see, it's pretty much brought it back down to uh, uh, early 2021 levels. So we haven't quite done the full retrace, which means there's still some health in that system. There's also a little bit of leverage still in there, so just something to be, be, uh, be careful and cautious of um, should things start to deteriorate or start to recover in either direction. Now, if we look at the stablecoin uh, uh, portion of the market, stablecoins have really risen to become arguably the unit of account. They've essentially become the base trading pair, both on DEXs and on centralized exchanges. Now, a very interesting dynamic, this blue curve down the bottom here, we can see in the green, sorry, is the aggregate stablecoin market cap of the top four, Tether, USDC, DAI, and Binance USD. So combine those all together, what's the aggregate market cap? The black line is in the Ethereum market cap, and we can see that it dipped down below so we, Ethereum was actually flipped by those top four market, uh, top four stable coins for a very brief period. Now, through all of the bull runs, stablecoin dominance got to about 50% of Ethereum's market cap, and then Ethereum went on a run and actually increased that ratio. So stablecoins overall shrunk relative to Ethereum, and every time they got to about 50%, Ethereum was able to go on another run. Now, what we can see is as we came into 2022, note this acceleration into. So we actually broke through that 0.5 level convincingly as Ethereum really washed out. And this washout aligns with this um, uh, total value locked flush out. So we can see that not only was there a flush out of value, but much of that value moved into the stablecoin space and Ethereum's market cap fell until it actually descended below the cumulative or aggregate value of these stablecoins. So a flipping probably a lot of people didn't expect, but it was the flipping that we got. So Ethereum has since recovered from there. And again, this will be an interesting one to see whether we can maintain that momentum and Ethereum can continue to push forward. Now, underneath the surface of that, we also have a changing dynamic in terms of the dominance of which stablecoins actually are the largest. So Tether here in green, you can see it reached over $80 billion in total value and has since, particularly after the lunar collapse, and there was a bit of a scare in terms of stablecoin stability, we've seen a market preference starting to descend out of Tether and into things like USDC, into Binance USD, and DAI also saw a reduction in overall supply, part of that deleveraging, because DAI is essentially a debt instrument. It's a dollar that's based on collateral that was borrowed. So as we got the flush out, we naturally got a decline in the amount of DAI in the system. But we can definitely see that the dominance of Tether has declined quite significantly and throughout the 2021-22 phase, USDC has been on a absolute tear gaining market share and so has Binance USD. So if we actually plot this out in terms of dominance between those four stable coins, here's Tether back here in 2020 at 85% dominance or 90% dominance, and it has been on a continual decline. It's now actually less than half at about 45% of overall stable coin dominance. Meanwhile, USDC continues to grow and climb. It's the largest stablecoin that's locked inside smart contracts, and so we're seeing it's widely used within the DeFi ecosystem. Binance USD has also gained significant market share, and so has DAI as a result of Tether declining. 
So you can see that there's these fundamental shifts going on under the surface that's really signifying that the market structure is changing during this bear market, and it's therefore going to set the stage for what comes next. So now moving into the Bitcoin phase, we're going to explore the Bitcoin bear market, and then we'll go along and look at the Ethereum uh, at an equivalent level. So in terms of the price drawdown, we can see we got to about 75% drawdown in total. It's not the worst in terms of drawdowns we've had in the past. We've seen 85, 85, and even as far down as 92% drawdowns in previous bears. You can see that there's a general uptrend over time, signifying that there's more support coming in for these assets as they become you know, increasingly ingrained within the economic system. There's more people who are aware of it. There's more people who believe in Bitcoin. We see that support tends to come in a little bit earlier, but it does signify that in terms of a percent down basis, we're actually not even as bad as we've seen in previous bear markets. It has been worse, even though it's still been a pretty angry bear in 2022. Now we did descend. This is the MVRV ratio and the realized price. So the realized price is basically the average cost basis of every coin in the supply. And then the MVRV is like a profit multiple. So high value signify the market is in a large degree of profit. And these red zones in particular signify when the market is underwater on their position on average. So let's zoom in on the last five years. And what we can see is that when the MVRV turns red, it generally signifies the market is underwater and we're approaching the late stage bear phase. We saw it briefly here for about seven days in March 2020. And here we are for about 35 days we spent below the realized price. And recently we have actually broken back above. So this signifies the market is now back into, on average, a degree of profit. And generally speaking, that profitability improves the odds of a recovery. So certainly paying attention to this realized price, which is about 21,800, paying attention to how price responds over the coming weeks to that particular level will be important because it shows, is the market actually ready to maintain that some kind of upwards recovery? Or are we actually going to head back below that cost base? And perhaps this bear market isn't quite over yet. Now, in a very unique circumstance, we can split that MVRV into different cohorts. We have the aggregate market in orange. We have short-term holders, which is under five-month holding period in red. And we have long-term holders who are above that five-month holding period in blue. Now, the reason that we use this five-month period or 155 days is statistically based on the way that coins are spent. Once a coin has been dormant in an investor's wallet for that five-month period, probabilistically, it's much less likely to be spent. So when we look at the actual spending behavior, the statistics tell us that that's approximately the time frame in which someone really has transitioned. They've seen enough volatility that they become that long-term holder mindset. So that's the reason why we use that. Now, you can see in these red zones, these are periods in time when all three cohorts are underwater. It doesn't happen very often, and it typically only happens at late stage bear markets. Now we can see that here we are about 35 days where all of these cohorts were underwater. Now, long-term holders and the aggregate market are now back in profit. So this period has actually now ended, which again signifies that it's perhaps we have a recovery on the horizon. Short-term holders, on the other hand, are still lagging. So they may still offer a little bit of resistance as they try to get their money back, but we will see how this plays out. It's certainly signifying that it looks similar to previous bear cycles. And we can then look at the net unrealized profit and loss, or the NUPL metric. Now, this one here is basically looking at all of that unrealized profit or loss as a percentage of market cap. So you can see that we have broken back above the capitulation zone here in red. Down here, it's really showing how much of the market cap is held at a loss. And we got down to about minus 16%. So 16% of the market cap, if we look at all of the losses that were held by investors, 16% of the market cap was essentially that same volume. We can see it did get much worse down here at 44% or 42% back here in uh, 2018. And what our current level is, is actually not dissimilar to March 2020. So we've seen these levels of pain before. And now that we're getting a bit of a recovery, it's perhaps starting to look like these previous bear cycles. We do get some upwards momentum, but we do have to watch and see if it drops back below this level, which may signify there is further capitulation to come. Now, another metric that I love to use is the net realized profit and loss. So what this chart up here is looking at is the unrealized profit and loss. Think about all of the coins that investors hold. How much profit are they or how much loss are they? What this one here is looking at, now let's only look at the people who are spending. This is the spending behavior. 
So this is the realized, not the unrealized, the realized portion of profit and loss. Now, what we can see is these very, very deep capitulations, these large negative prints. This is essentially showing that the market is washing out. People who bought the top are capitulating and saying, that's it, I need to get out of this market. Now, what we had is the lunar collapse and then another one here on the 18th of June. This was the largest that we've ever seen, $4.2 billion in net losses. This takes off the profits as well. So the actual losses were even larger than this because we can factor out the profits. So a very, very significant, historically large capitulation as we sold down below the 2017 all-time high. Now, what I'm paying attention to is this recovery. Note how the losses are gradually getting less and less and less, and perhaps in recent times, we've actually broken up into profits. Now, what we really want to see for a sustained recovery is moving back into profitable territory and the market is able to absorb those profits. You want people to be able to sell, take some money and chips off the table, but there's enough demand to keep the market going. So a sustained period of net profitability, this metric staying green and price recovering or trading sideways is generally a good sign because it means that demand is able to come in and take those swing trader profits and continue to push the market forward. There's the other alternative where perhaps that sell side overwhelms the market and we have to descend again. So this is certainly a metric I'm paying attention to if we can get into the green zone of profits being realized and maintain it alongside healthy price, that would be a good sign and a good confirmation of a recovery and vice versa. Now on the Ethereum side, it's much the same. So we'll just kind of touch on these different elements and look at what is unique. So similarly, Ethereum's drawdown over 80%, not quite as severe as the 95% we had back here in 2018. So it was much, much worse back then. And you can see that the duration is also much longer. This was about 500 days, not dissimilar actually to Bitcoin's 2015 era. So on a relative scale in terms of um, price drawdown, not as bad. And on a duration basis, also nowhere near as bad as previous bears. So perhaps that means there's support in the market, um, but it also may mean there's duration ahead of us just to be aware of. Now, Ethereum is in the process as we speak. 1630 um, is really where the realized price is of attempting to break above its realized price. We can see here in 2018, 2019, it also had an attempt which then failed and returned back under the realized price. In fact, it had two attempts that failed, which again, very, very similar to Bitcoin back in 2015. So what we're really paying attention to here is can it break above convincingly and hold that $1,630 mark, which would put the market on aggregate back into a level of profit. Now, we can also look at the staked ETH, the ETH that's gone into the 2.0 deposit contract. And what we actually notice is that because people can put their coins in, but they can't withdraw them just yet until the merge is complete and that next hard fork comes in, people actually can't withdraw their ETH. So therefore, we can calculate what is the average price that people deposited their coins. And that's what this purple curve up the top here is showing us. And that's at $2,370 which is much higher than the average price of 1630. So what that actually means is that people who deposited their ETH into the 2.0 contract are actually holding much, much larger losses than, any, than, than the average market because they can't sell. We'll talk about this in a bit of nuance in a second. But at the peak, we saw that the amount of ETH in the deposit contract was holding something like $16 billion worth of unrealized loss. So all of the coins that people had deposited, the, uh, the market price had fallen so far below their average deposit price that they were essentially holding a $16 billion loss in aggregate, which is very, very significant. And as a result of that, this red zone down the bottom here, this is looking at the total value staked by different providers. Now, what we have here in the red is Lido, and Lido currently holds over 30% of all staked ETH. Now, when you have such an issue where so many people are holding underwater coins, they're able to sell their staked ETH if it's a liquid staking derivative like staked ETH, ST ETH. So it makes sense why we've seen such an explosive growth of Lido because people were able to hedge their positions. And we can actually see that as the market started to top, Lido started to explode higher we saw that there was more people demanding that liquid staking derivative so that they could hedge, collateralize, and exit their position without having to just weather the storm and hold their staked ETH without any reprieve. 
So it does make sense why we've seen this explosion in Lido's particularly um, as a liquid staking derivative. And very similar in terms of the net unrealized profit and losses, much the same as Bitcoin. You can use these same metrics to track the Ethereum side as well. We can see that the overall sell-off, the amount of unrealized losses reached about 45%. So almost half of Ethereum's market cap was held in a loss, but it got much, much worse back here in the previous bear cycle. Over 60%, March 2020 was over 88%. So it hasn't been quite as severe, even though the dollar size of this thing is much, much larger. And similarly, on our net realized profit and loss, we had two major capitulations. The first one here when, when Luna collapsed, $2.5 billion. And then again, during that uh, uh, 18th of June sell-off, when we had over $2.6 billion in losses. So again, we have this recovery pattern that seems to be in play and people are starting to realize profits, which again is a healthy sign for the Ethereum space and really what we want to be seeing for a sustained recovery. Now, the very, very last section that I want to look at is the mining sector. And what we're looking at here is the Bitcoin difficulty in blue and an estimated difficulty price in purple. Now, what we can see is that difficulty actually broke past the all-time high here in May before the Great Migration. We broke above that as the bear market was already in effect. And note that we pushed up to significant all-time highs, and it has since been corrected. So what does this mean? Well, revenue is falling as the price declines from up here at 60000 all the way down to 17600 And at the same time, the cost of production was increasing. Difficulty represents the cost of production. Now, this purple curve actually caught the wick of this bottom at 17,600. This is the cost of production estimate. What we're doing is taking a log-log regression between price and difficulty or market cap and difficulty. And what that really picks up is a very, very strong model to predict the all-in cost. What is the average cost to mine a single BTC? And this aligns with many estimates using power and um, different rig efficiencies. We see a very similar number come out. And impressively, this actually caught the wick of this particular sell-off. So it's interesting, Bitcoin as a commodity returned to its cost of production and has then since recovered, which is very, very similar to what we see across many commodity markets. Now, during this bear market, what we have here in orange is Bitcoin and in blue, Ethereum. This is the overall mining revenue on a daily basis. Now, note that Bitcoin dominated through the first part of 2021. Then we had the Ethereum. Uh, this is when NFTs really exploded and the gas fees really became a very significant portion of Ethereum mining revenue. It exploded much, much higher. I think it was over uh, almost 2x what Bitcoin was earning in a single day. But over the course of this bear market, we've seen both of these mining revenues contract back down to approximately $18 million per day. So we've seen a collapsing of mining revenue back towards that 18 million level, and essentially they're now mining at very, very similar levels of profitability. Now, as a result of this, cost of production for Bitcoin mining is going up, revenues are falling. So then we can look at the hash ribbon, which is looking at when we have a slowdown in difficulty and a slowdown in hash rate. It means miners are under stress, their income is stressed, and they must switch off rigs that are not profitable to maintain their overall profitability because you don't want to be running a rig that literally costs you more to run than you're earning in profit. So when we see this decline in overall hash rate, the hash ribbon inverted right before that sell-off that we had down below the year uh, on the 18th of June. And during this process, we actually saw that some miners, I think Core Scientific unloaded about 75% of their overall BTC holdings. So we have seen that actual evidence of minor capitulation. And the hash ribbons really signaled this before we had this major decline, and they're in the process of trying to recover, but we haven't yet reached that point yet. And to really sum that up, what we have here is the minor capitulation tracking. We have two different models. In the purple, we have the difficulty ribbon compression. What this is describing is when we actually are observing difficulty coming down because rigs are being switched off and rigs will only be switched off when they're not profitable. So it signifies an explicit observation that there is stress in the system. In the orange, we then have the pure multiple, which is an oscillator tracking minor profitability. And we can see that when both of these are at very low values, it will trigger this yellow zone. This is basically signifying we have both income stress and observed reduction in mining capacity. 
So it's kind of a confirmation that we really do have capitulation in play. And thus, we should be nervous that miners may well have to liquidate some of their treasuries, which over the last couple of weeks, we have in fact seen happen. And what we can see is that both of these have triggered, so we do have a mining capitulation. We can see that in the data. We can also see it in the actual uh, public filings for these public miners. And we can finally close it out by looking at the actual distribution by these miners. And what we can see is they did experience a period of significant sell down. This was something on the order of about 12,000 BTC. They had to liquidate over the course of a couple of weeks, but they have started to recover back into an uptrend. So perhaps some of that mining capitulation is in fact now behind us. We're starting to see a little bit of a signal that recovery is happening across the board. And lastly, what we're looking at is the Ethereum miner capitulation. This is looking at the same concept. We can see that our difficulty ribbon has inverted quite significantly and mining revenue in terms of the pure multiple is quite low. And what we're seeing is that there's a combination of things, both the reduced revenue, but also as the merge comes up, as we start to move towards September when the merge is actually planned, miners are gonna start either switching to other coins, having to mine elsewhere, or they're gonna to have to start selling their GPU rigs back into the market, whether it's for gaming or AI uses, whatever it is, we're gonna start seeing miners continue to drop off in that lead up. So there's a number of elements that we can pay attention to to really see, is there any potential sell pressure coming from these miners? Are they gonna to have to liquidate to cover their costs? Or are we just gonna see mining hardware start to move to different chains? So thank you for tuning in for that. Hopefully you found that a useful overview. It's a very big top to bottom. I do recommend you jump in and read the report, which you'll find a link to in the description below. Do check out the live dashboard and do also take advantage of that offer that we have through to the end of August, um, getting that one month off your advanced subscription. And as always, you can reach me in the comments, ask me any questions that you want about the content, the material, the metrics. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any that you have. So until the next video, I'll see you then. Cheers.